Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rigging to the Com video, we're going to have a very internal focused video of news, of course, which has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with God Mode Ponage. That's according to researchers who are investigating the Intel management engine issues which plague certain Intel processors. Then we'll touch on another Intel focus thing, and that is that they are making and developing a self-learning processor, which they claim to act like a human brain. An update of sorts that the Intel Z370 platform will indeed support the 8th generation Canon Lake processors. And we'll finish the video with the i7-8600K, specifically, of course, benchmarks which have leaked. But, as I said, the first thing we're going to start out with is Ponage. So for those unfamiliar with the issue, there is a exploit, let's use the word exploit, in Intel's management engine, also known as ME. Now the security concern is regarding the active management technology which runs atop this engine. Now there has been some information that's been widely published which allows vendors and users to disable the AMT. And security researchers have said that they've found a way to exploit Intel's um, management engine. And they're gonna be revealing this fully in the Black Hat in Europe um, uh, during December. And Positive Technologies, you gotta love the name, says that the exploit, quote, allows an attacker of the machine to run unsigned code in the platform controller hub on any motherboard via Skylake Plus. Now, I just want to clarify something because you're going to say, well, okay, that's fine. I've got whatever version of an antivirus and I've patched my operating system. I'm fine, right? Not so much. Because ME runs independently of the operating system. So you don't actually know if you're compromised. You can't like control alt delete and look through the list of processes, for example. So this isn't something you can just reinstall your operating system or even a BIOS update. So if you do have um, a system which is vulnerable to this, I do suggest you do some Googling. I'll link in the video description a um, article or two, and then you can just follow the steps if you so desire. So, um, speaking of Intel and things that could possibly go wrong, I'd like to introduce you to their, what they consider to be a neuromorphic chip. Now this... Uh, Intel formally are referring to as the Intel Luhi, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, it's L-O-I-H-I, -I, test chip. Now it's a self-learning processor and in theory at least will be developed for the usage in AI intensive applications. Now they, of course, using the PR speak as you would expect, also believe it's going to have one obvious primary purpose, and that is robotics, and this does naturally also mean uh, self-driving cars, that type of thing. I'm going to read out a statement from Michael Mayberry, who is the Managing Director of Intel Labs. The Intel Luhi research test chip includes digital circuits that mimic the brain's basic mechanics, making machine learning faster and more efficient while requiring less compute power. This could help computers self-organize and make decisions based on patterns and associations. Now, if you're interested in AI, le um, deep learning, artificial intelligence, that type of thing, you may have also heard of uh, Google's cloud-based approach, which is the Tensor Processing Unit, also known as TPU. Now, you're going to say, well, what the heck's the difference here? Well, primarily, that's designed to make machine learning faster, when it comes to cloud-based solutions, this is more local. So in other words, it can be used for something that's autonomous. In other words, you can think of it, uh, <laughs> I don't like to <laughs> envisage, you know, the T-800, but something along the lines of a robot or a device which is capable of just doing its own thing. Put it this way, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily feel comfortable with an AI which requires an, the internet or a network to run if I'm, say, in a vehicle, because that probably wouldn't be a very good thing. Obviously, if it's self-driving and let's say there's a problem with the network in that area and it goes down, well, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't particularly like to uh, meet the local tree in the local park or perhaps the you know largest rock formation that happens to be residing nearby. 
Okay, so next topic, and this one actually was sent in by a viewer. His name is Kyle, so thanks very much to him. This one's a bit of an oddity, so I'm going to give you the quick situation, or the basic situation, before I report the news. So a website by the name of Tweaktown actually reports that the Intel Z370 platform will support 8th generation Canon Lake processors. However, the weird thing is that you can find it in Google Cache, but the actual article is no longer live on their website. So I'm not sure if there's something hinky going on with their website or not, because I had thought originally this could just be a rumor or something like that, but according to them, this is a verbatim quote, uh, Intel has confirmed to tweak town all current and future 8th generation Intel Core desktop processors will be compatible with the Intel Z370 chipset as well as the forthcoming Intel 300 series chipset family SKUs, SKUs. So obviously the reason that I'm bringing this up is because it wasn't too long ago, actually just earlier this month, uh, maybe not even that long ago, maybe just a week or so, that we heard rumors that the 8th generation um, processors on Z370 could piss people off even further than what they already have because... If you want to go with the much-touted 8-core processors, which, once again, are going to be presumably based on Canon Lake, at least according to the rumours, although even those are a bit iffy at the moment because some people say that they're still going to be based on Coffee Lake, so we'll just have to wait on that. But regardless, Canon Lake, of course, is going to be 10nm, and there were some uh, concerns that for the Z370, essentially, you get, like, this cut-off. So to actually utilize the eight, the eight core processors, you actually instead would need to then plonk down next year on the, the Z390 chipset, which once again, obviously it was fairly upsetting people, and I'm putting that rather mildly. So I'm not quite sure what the state of affairs is here. I'm just telling you that it could be maybe uh, Intel uh, decided to kind of go back on this. Perhaps there was something wrong with the article, I'm not sure, but as I said, you can quite happily find this in the actual web cache, so with any luck at least, if you do want to uh, buy a Z370 motherboard, you're not going to be left in the cold, let's say, uh, the latter part of next year. Finally, we're going to discuss some benchmarks of the i5-8600K. And yes, we also have some further benchmarks of the 8700K, but I went into a lot of those yesterday anyway. But hey, this one is from a different website, so it's good to have multiple data points, right? More data points are better than one data point, which is pretty obvious. Anyway, um, so this information comes to us from PC Online, which of course is a Chinese-based website. Um... You can quite clearly see what the benchmark is in the top left, but I'll read out some of the interesting ones. I'll also link, of course, to their website in the video description. I'm going to certainly not read all of the benchmarks out or show you all the benchmarks because A, that's unfair to them, and B, I think you'll probably get the pattern quite bloody quickly. So we're going to start out with Cinebench R15, our best friend in the universe at this point. And essentially, the blue represents, as you can probably tell, uh, multi-threading, while as yellow represents the single-thread performance. I'm going to focus, once again, on the 8600K, but you can, of course, look at all the results. So the 8600K um, essentially is almost identical to the 7700K. It um, is just a few points slower in single-thread performance, and it's around 80-ish points slower in multi-thread performance. Things do somewhat change, however, when it comes to CPU-Z. You're looking at about a 200-point difference between... And yes, I am rounding this up quite considerably. About a 200-point difference between the 8600 and the 7700K, whereas in single-thread performance, they're almost identical. There's about a 20-point difference. Uh, next up, POV Ray Benchmark. Obviously, I don't need to tell you this, but the 8700K absolutely a ruffle stomps. All of the others, it's about 1,200 points higher than the 8600K. Them threads are handy, but once again, it's only about mm, a couple of percent difference, really, if you... Well, okay, much more than a couple of percent, about 10% difference between the 8600 and the 7700K. So what we can quite clearly see through these results, and we'll look at one other just to kind of clarify the point when it comes to synthetics and productivity benchmarks, uh, we'll use W prime 2.10, and this is the 1024M test. 
8700 k is getting 110 uh, which is about double that of the 8600k but the 7700k uh, manages to score 195 so obviously in terms of performance the 8600k is yes a little bit slower here it's taking more seconds in other words to complete the task but for those who currently have a slower processor and are thinking hey maybe i should go for the 8600k for productivity reasons then yes, you're probably going to get a slightly better performance than your friend who currently has a 7700K. Finally, a couple of game benchmarks. Rise of the Tomb Raider. Yup, almost identical once again. Although to be fair with these tests, it's probably more GPU focused at this point. Uh, let's face it, you're getting 70 frames a second with 8600K, whereas even the 1600X is only getting uh, one frame per second lower at 69, 8700K is hitting at 72. Actually, the singularity, of course, very multi-thread orientated. Uh, 8600K is getting 104, whereas the 8700K is getting 120. And the Ryzen 1800X, I think this is quite interesting, manages to score 101 frames per second. So what does this mean? Well, the 8600K, honestly, I would personally rather plonk down the extra cash um, on an i7. That's just my personal opinion, because I do feel that you don't know what direction the wind's going to blow and how long it's going to be before developers, and by developers I of course mean games developers, really are going to be taking to leverage the additional threads available. However, even if you are only interested in an 8600K, I feel that it's really going to come down to the averages of overclocking. For example, let's say both chips manage to hit 5.2 gigahertz on average, and by average I mean with a reasonable air cooler slash AIO, and you don't have to de lid and, you know, basically do a goat sacrifice to hit that. We're talking like, you know, something that average user is going to be able to hit quite comfortably without too much effort. Then I would probably suggest that for most folks, 8600K is going to be enough. But if you do feel that, you know, you're kind of going to do a little bit of productivity work, as usual, um, I would still go with 8700K. The other option, of course, is either a Ryzen 5 1600X or one of the Ryzen 7s. I still feel that 1800X is way overpriced for what it is. I, as always, would suggest the Ryzen 7 1700. That's my opinion. Uh, we will be doing a full Coffee Lake benchmark slash review in the not-too-distant future. But with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.